I'm gonna sort of basically walk through the, the, the steps that I went through um, taking that first leap, because this is kind of a scary thing to, to leave your normal sort of life and go and start a company. Um, and I'll sort of break it into a couple of different sort of sections. I think um, the, the, the one interesting realization I had sort of writing this, I've never actually sort of formally sat down and thought about it or talked about it before, is that um, the, the actual steps involved to starting and growing and even just selling a company, um, the steps themselves are actually pretty simple and they're not that difficult. The more complex thing is getting out of your own way and kind of, uh, it's, it's more about sort of internal personality traits that allow you to, to do some of these things uh, rather than the steps themselves. And so I sat down and I thought, okay, if I'm gonna build a presentation for folks that are thinking that they'd like to go and, and start their own company, they'd like to own and run their own business, well, what are the steps? Steps are actually pretty straightforward. So you go and you find a legal clerk, you can pay a few small fees, you can incorporate your company, it's like a couple hundred bucks, the state of Delaware will give you a, a corporation. Um, and then you need to go to the effort of actually listing yourself as a shareholder and then you name yourself as the CEO. And once you've done that, you're pretty much done. You own your own business and you run it as well because you are now the CEO of your company. And so, you know, once you've done that, you can kind of go and hang out with all of your peers because technically you're in the exact same position as all of these guys. The shareholders appointed them as CEO, they're CEOs of their company. There's not really that much that differentiates the like technical uh, position other than that. I'm gonna dive into this a little bit. It's more of a, this will be the most sort of out there session I think in all of Casual Connect because it won't have that much to do with mobile gaming. The company I did start was a mobile advertising company. We had a small cross promotion uh, sort of platform. It's similar to, to Chartboost if you guys know them. Uh, and we allowed little groups of indie games to swap ads for each other and swap users. And it's a, it was a sort of a free and easy way to get users uh, for newcomers into the, into the mobile app space. Um, so what I realized is that all the steps themselves are not that complicated. And it turned out that all these personality quirks, a lot of them I, I was embarrassed by. I thought these were like oddities about myself, but they turned out to be useful uh, when I was doing this and basically sort of walking away from my normal career path and, and, and going down the startup route. And so instead of going through all these sort of concrete steps, which are pretty straightforward and easy, they're, they're you know, fairly, uh, fairly basic and they're not that insightful, what I wanted to do is go through uh, these various kind of quirks that, that turned out to be really useful, just about sort of the way I grew up and, and the way we uh, ended up getting the company going. And these are things that, if you guys are curious about doing it yourself, um, they're, they're things that most people actually have already. They just need to sort of bring it out and develop it. So, the first source, I was, uh, I was actually homeschooled as a small child. And again, this is something I was embarrassed about. I used to always think it was very, it was so odd. I just wanted to go play with my buddies and go to school and you know, be like all the normal kids. Uh, it, was also, it was also kind of tricky because my folks weren't teachers. So we had to uh, go through just that grade's textbooks and learn stuff in order to get ready for the exam at the end of the year. So we were kind of on our own and we had to learn how to teach ourselves stuff and learn how to do things. And it turns out when you're, when you're setting up a company and sort of trying to bring people together to do stuff uh, for you and for the, for the company, um, so much of it is, requires learning on the job. So it's actually, it turned out to be a huge asset that I knew how to just sit with a textbook and teach myself how to pass that grade um, when I was out there trying to do it with the company. So I had kind of quirky hippie parents and they homeschooled us and I used to just think that was the biggest like drag in the world, but it turned out to be uh, really useful doing the company. So the other thing that homeschooling gave me, this is actually kind of useful down the road, is that it, it gave me this separation from the herd. So again, all I wanted to do is go play with my friends and do sports and hang out with the kids at school, and I, I could sometimes, but I was very much not part of the everyday kind of mix of that. And um, that separation, you have to understand, if you want to go out and start a company, if that's something you guys are looking at doing, you're not, you know, your, your friends and your peers at, at work or at school, they'll, they'll be supportive, but they're not gonna go do it themselves. At least large amounts of them probably won't, which means that you really have to think for yourself and act for yourself, which is, it, it's, you know, it's, it's not as uh, common as you would think to see people who truly can sort of break off of the herd and go and do things for themselves. 
And that was something that, that turned out to be really, it was an attribute rather than a sort of uh, burden from, from homeschooling. So the other thing that, that I learned pretty early was, I'll call it instinctual listening. I was dropped into uh, Germany as a small child. I had to go and learn how to speak another language. I was 14 or something. So I was too old to actually properly learn a language easily and I had to figure it out uh, from scratch. And uh, one thing that I got very good at was, was figuring out what people were trying to say without understanding anything. It was, it was very tough. I was 14 years old. I didn't understand any of the words people said, and I still had to do stuff because you have to speak with people all the time. So people would try to make small talk. They'd want to know what I wanted to eat. And um, maybe I knew maybe 30 or 40 words going into it, and I had to get very good very quickly at interpreting what they were saying by uh, the way the group was sort of standing and the way people were like gesticulating and their expressions and, and things like that. So not only did I have to get good at understanding that without understanding their words, I had to get good at speaking, um, I guess, a little bit more physically uh, because I couldn't also, I also couldn't say what I needed to say. So this turned out to be uh, extremely useful when you're actually sort of bringing a group of people together and, and going out to, to start a company and start a business. Uh, so let's see, when I was like 14, 15 when I went to Germany. I was maybe 15 when I started working at restaurants. And this is another, you know, it's the least glamorous thing ever. Most people would never, like, get up in front of you to talk about being a CEO and brag about being a busboy. But I must have spent a total of six or seven years uh, working as a busboy or a bartender. I was, like, washing dishes. I was cutting vegetables. It was the least glamorous stuff ever. Um, and it's not, I, I'm not going to, the point isn't that I learned how to work hard. That's kind of cliche. It's more that um, I became very familiar with the fact that at any point in time, there's, like, laundry list of crap that needs to be done. There's just always stuff to be done, uh, no matter what. Even at a restaurant that's empty, there, you should be like rolling cutlery, you should be wiping tables, there's just, there's never any end of stuff that needs to be done. And when you're running a business, it's the exact same, uh, that, that sort of never ending to-do list just becomes a reality. The other thing is being a, uh, being a busboy is about as low as it gets on the totem pole, like in the whole universe. Uh, and you've got to get your hands dirty and do lots of do you know, some less than glamorous tasks. And when you're trying to start a company with a, with a low budget, uh, you you have to do a lot of things. Like I may have been a CEO on paper, and I may have had peers like these guys technically, but I was taking out trash. I was like cutting like groceries for my for my engineers. I was doing all sorts of uh, rugged things for them to make it work. So people talk about always be closing ABC. Uh, I think that's bullshit. If you're if you're not doing things to get to the close, uh, it'll never happen. So I just skipped the C, and I like, I like to think about always be doing. So I'm always trying to do things that move the company forward um, to get it to work. And this is true in the early days too, when you're even when you're just trying to prepare yourself for setting it up. And there's always a long list of things that you could do to 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 get prepared for it. Um, and you should just always be doing things that get you that direct in that direction. So that was, like I say, I was a busboy for like in my early teens, I guess. And then I think I was, I was maybe like 17 or something. I got my first big company corporate job. And I never want to do it again. It was, it was no fun. The, the thing that it taught me, though, let's see, I was, a, I was an analyst at Juniper Networks, a big networking company in Sunnyvale. And um, the thing that I learned is that you know, we were analyzing all these little startups that we wanted to acquire. We were a giant, giant company. And I realized that even some companies that maybe had good engineers and good technology, they weren't the ones that we would often choose to acquire. We would sometimes just acquire the companies that were the best polished. And I thought it was absurd at first. Uh, but the more I dug into it, I just realized that you know, absurd or not, that's just the reality. So if your company is, you know, has better branding and the people are presentable and energetic when they talk to you and um, the way that that company sort of operates is really clearly laid out and, and, and polished. Um, also, their legal documents, if maybe all their incorporation documents are very polished, there's no like outstanding shares that are weird to deal with or anything like that. Uh, it's actually easier to acquire that company. It's less work, and people that acquire companies are lazy, and they want the cleaner, easier company. Um, so polish is a huge, huge asset. So that was you know my first internship. So. Again, up until here, nothing 
at all glamorous has happened, and I'm already at sort of quirk number five out of eight. So most of these things, I didn't realize I had them, but they were kind of there already. And I think most of the folks, maybe the four of you guys, uh, have it too. And if you're looking at starting a company, uh, that's where I would, I would sort of focus on things like this rather than learning the actual steps themselves. The next one, Alfred. Now, Alfred is one of my best friends. He is also the co-founder who was delusional enough to like get this whole thing in motion. And I shouldn't, he deserves a lot of credit, but he was totally nuts with some of the first stuff that he really wanted to do, uh, which is a necessary, sort of a necessary component if you want to go out and start a company. So, you know, a lot of people are somewhat delusional. I think most people are a little bit delusional, but it takes like a mountain of delusion to actually make a real sort of step, uh, especially if the step involves sacrifice or, or moving away from the sort of routine uh, path. So a lot of people are like pretty delusional. They're like junior league delusional as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you need to be like pro league delusional to be able to, to actually convince yourself that you're like at all ready or like good enough to actually go out and, and, and start a company. So, so let's see, so we were, I was in college with these guys. Alfred and, Alfred and I went to high school together. And um, I was always sort of crossover. I would like try to do sports, but I was a geek at heart. So I played StarCraft with the engineers, and Alfred was, was one of my sort of StarCraft buddies. And him and one other engineer had this idea. They had a, they had a mobile advertising technology that worked really well in developing economies. So they had uh, a way to serve ads in low bandwidth areas. And this is back in 2011, 12. And me being a pretentious sort of college kid said, well, my professor told me that Brazil, Russia, India, and China are growing very, very quickly. So China is like a great market to go to. And I was like very full of myself at this point. I was like, okay, and mobile is growing very quickly too. So if we're gonna start a business, why not look for a growing market, China, and mobile, which is a growing platform, and we can build this technology uh, into that area. And, the, and where Alfred really put us over the, over the edge in terms of delusion is that he had genuine customers in China that wanted our technology. So we were very excited in college. We got all fired up because we had customers that wanted to serve their ads in China and they needed an ad server to do it. So, you know, of course I didn't even think to, to see if these were real sort of offers or, as far as I was concerned, this was practically revenue in the bank and we furiously got to work. We set up an incorporation. We incorporated our company, and I was very pleased that we were all executive officers of this special little startup company. Um, and the engineers got together and started working on uh, the ad server. So they started building the ad server. We started doing little tests. But if it weren't for Alfred's like extra huge dose of delusion, thinking that we had revenue already in the bank in China as a bunch of super naive infants in Canada, uh, we wouldn't have actually set sail and started the company. But it was enough, so we got moving. So we, you know, we, we, took, this, we took this technology and we, we shopped it to a couple of investors. We found a small uh, accelerator group in China that specialized in uh, Western entrepreneurs trying to launch businesses inside of China. It's called China Accelerator. It was done by the Techstars folks. And eventually, we, we spoke to a couple other people, but eventually they were, the, they were the best fit for us and they were interested in getting involved and I think they were impressed by how confident we were that we were gonna make this big impact and they invested, invested $15,000 into our little company and we were, so, we were so pumped up. So we took this 15K, we moved to China throughout 2012 and uh, basically immediately crashed and burned and lost all our money. We, we, we survived for maybe three months in China and um, our servers worked, our tech worked, but we couldn't track down the customers for the life of us, so we had no revenue at all. We couldn't um, raise money either, because who on earth would invest in sort of a, a bunch of Canadian children uh, with no sort of, with no uh, meaningful track to revenue? And, uh, and, and we went to this demo day, the Accelerator did put on a demo day for us, so we. When presented to a bunch of investors, we spent like our last thousand dollars on um, like this crummy hostel in the middle of Beijing, and we waited for all the follow-up meetings we were going to get, and we didn't get a single follow-up meeting. So we we very quickly realized that this is like so much harder than we thought, uh, and you know 
we, we very quickly sort of realized that we had a, a heck of a lot more work to do, and we can't, we, we realized that we can't really make it work in China, because we don't speak the language, and we don't have actual, we don't have a hope in hell in getting real customers to take us seriously. Um, but also, uh, raising money was not really gonna be an answer, especially in China, and that even if things look great on paper, like China is a growing market, mobile is sort of also growing, uh, that doesn't mean that it's a sort of surefire business at all. So we wrapped it up, we had our tails between our legs, everyone went home, I lived at my folks' place for like a month, and, um, and I kind of sort of licked my wounds a little bit, and I remember uh, I met with this 19-year-old kid, he was maybe two years younger than me at the time, and I was buddies with him from college, he said, oh, you're doing mobile ads, let's talk, so we hung out. I thought he wanted an internship or something, and uh, turns out, I don't know if any of you guys were around when they were sort of in the early days of display advertising, when people were like buying and selling ad space on the web, it's like 2008, 2009, 2010. It was, it was a crap show. So this kid was like 16 or 17 years old, he was making like a million bucks a year, two million bucks a year, because he knew how to buy and sell ads, and he treated it like a video game. It was totally trivial to him, but he was making like massive amounts of cash. And this was happening all over the place in this industry, because it was so brand new. Um, and so here, here I was thinking he was going to give us an internship, or thinking he was going to ask us for an internship, and he wrote us a check for 50K. So all of a sudden, we had like another stab at this, and our like rotting carcass of a Chinese sort of venture could be rejuvenated. So, um, you know, we went and we rented a house in Toronto, and we, we rebuilt everything around mobile gaming. This is back when, uh, you know, this is kind of, when mobile gaming was starting to really grow to the point where people realized that getting users was really, really hard. Um, so we, we re-architected it to be this sort of ad exchange where groups of indie games could form alliances and swap ads for each other. So it was an easy way to get users. And the timing was decent. We actually thought the timing was very good. This is, like, Chartboost was like a tiny little company, so we thought, oh, don't worry about it, it's fine. And um, we got to work trying to capture that market. So we built, we rebranded to AppFuel, we you know, started coming to conferences like this uh, as often as we could. We, uh, we looked at ways to, to sort of win over the, uh, the indie app development uh, community. And, and we started getting our, our mojo back, so we were pretty pumped up. We took, we took this kind of rebuilt company and platform and we moved it to Palo Alto uh, where we could uh, you know, be closer to the customers and be closer to the partners and um, and then I realized that there's there's you know we we were so pumped up because we had we had raised a bit of angel money and we went on to raise a little bit more and, and we got some big names like uh, like Tim Draper he's one of our angels and a couple other folks uh, we started getting really sort of pumped up about how we were actually going to make it we thought we were going to do we were going to do pretty well and um, and then I realized that there was there's sort of another attribute that I still needed to sort of develop and that was this constant. I was gonna call it hunger, but it's more like a feeling of inadequacy. Like there's always so much more that you need to go out and actually do. So there is no end to, um, there's no end to it. Like you're always trying to, to grow your company and, and do well. And the source of it was my scary foreign relatives. So I had these very intimidating old European relatives that uh, no matter how like excited you are, uh, they've probably done something 10 times better and they're like, ah, okay, nice try. Like I think I went to, to one of my great uncles and was like, hey, we like, we're, we're doing a company, we're like we're executives in this new international market of ads and uh, we, raised, uh, we raised some capital and we're gonna go and launch the company. And he was like, uh, uh, other people's money, huh? <laughs> like, oh, damn it. shit, he's right. We have to go out and actually do something with the company. So there's never, this was sort of one of these, one of these things that I realized uh, you kind of need if you're gonna do a company like this is that you can kind of celebrate interim milestones, but until it's like a real self-sustaining, revenue-generating business, it's, 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 uh, it's not something to really high-five yourself about. And even then, it could be bigger and it could grow, and it's kind of this constant paranoia um, that, that, that turned out to be very useful uh, in this journey. So, so anyways, there we were. We had raised a little bit more cash. We were in mobile gaming. Turns out, once again, we were a little bit too late. So the SDK, uh, you guys probably know this, um, it's tough to get new SDKs into apps because most apps have tons of SDKs already. And we, here we were, like brand new, 
like this brand new startup on the block trying to push our new sexy SDK uh, into these game developers, and, and it was so saturated by the time. Like we were like a year and a half too late, but that was decades in app sort of time because uh, anyone who had anything had an SDK around it, and these apps had you know, dozens of SDKs already. So we had a very tough time. We had a very tough time penetrating. Uh, and, and what ended up happening was that <clears throat> not only was that an issue, but also most of the venture capitalists had already made their investments in the other sort of mobile advertising company. So even though we had this like sexy brand and we were in a space that seemed like it was a hot space, uh, we, we were once again sort of in trouble. And this is maybe three years in, and everyone was sort of emotionally exhausted and drained. Uh, and the, the one thing that most entrepreneurs and most of our, my investors wanted to do was just, you know, it, if it doesn't work, you kind of shut it down and you go do another one. And I didn't want to do that because I, like, from my, my little corporate internship, I thought, because of all the delusion I had, I thought, well, why don't I go and try to sell it? And most other entrepreneurs, I think, in fact, maybe even the rational thing to do at that point would have been to just walk away from it. Uh, but I really wanted to try it. I was delusional enough, and I thought I could polish it up to the right, right degree, and I really wanted to follow through. Um, so we spent about five, six months of, of time that we could have gone and started something else. We shopped it. So everything was kind of in tatters, but we pulled it together. We got the tech working really nicely, even though it didn't have customers. And we, uh, we shopped it, and we were able to find, this is a whole sort of talk unto itself, like the process of actually shopping and selling a, a company. But um, we were able to find like a good set of five or so uh, buyers that were interested, and then one of them, which is, we actually ended up selling to Tune in Seattle, the sort of Kochaba competitor, uh, and we're really happy about that. So the engineers are there, the product and technology went there, we became part of their team. Um, the, the acquisition was like a great success, our investors sort of did well. Uh, it, was, it, it turned out to be uh, a worthwhile sort of startup in general, which was nice. But um, Man, like the three years of sort of stomach ulcer and, and stress were, were pretty intense. So those are, the, those are the quirks, and these are all things I didn't realize were actually necessary, but they're way more necessary than knowing the steps to start a company. Um, so if you're, if you're in the position where you're looking at either joining a growth company on the ground floor or stepping out of your career and, and pulling together some folks, the actual mechanical steps are, it's kind of like doing a school project. You bring together some folks, you know, you work on a communal thesis, you build out some some materials, and then you're, you're off to the races. Um, but the thing that usually gets people caught up is more their own sort of, uh, the, the, way that, the way that they uh, sort of look at, the way they look at it just internally. So these are the, these are the quirks that, that help me do it. Anyway, that's what I got for you guys. Why would I not work at a big company again? Because this is so boring, oh my god. Are you kidding me? It's like, there's like cubicles and Nine to five, and everything you do, like you're a small piece in a giant machine, and you never get to see any output of any of your own output. You never see the rubber hitting the road ever. You sit at your desk, you have deadlines. I don't, ah, it's just awful. It's also freezing cold. They had the AC cranked up. You have to wear like dress shirts and shit. It's no fun. Uh, <laughs> but the other thing, it was torturous because I could see all these uh, entrepreneurs do cool stuff and like we would like make them bajillionaires overnight because we'd buy their companies. And I was like, you know what, like, these guys are they're not so smart. Like, <laughs> the steps are doable. You just you need to get the right people together and get the timing. The timing was the biggest, biggest part of it. Uh, I wanted to be on the other side of that, so I thought I would go try it. But big companies are just no fun. They're terrible. Yeah, Skyport's an interesting one. It's a, <laughs> I had a crisis like a, like a quarter life crisis after AppFuel. I wanted to do something tangible because mobile ads really bugged me. They were like not real enough. Um, and I wanted to go where there was a lot of revenue in the enterprise, they all have big budgets. And Juniper had got me pretty familiar with the hardware, like the IT space that I'm in. And um, so I, it was almost like a temper tantrum. I was like, I want to get out of mobile and advertising and I want to do the opposite of that. And so at Skyport, we, do you guys watch Silicon Valley? You know the show? We literally build a box. <laughs> we build a, like a physical box that goes into IT systems and it's a secure server so you run VMs on it. It's, like, it's a cool new product. I think it's gonna make a big difference. Uh, but the reason I chose it was because I wanted something physical, I wanted something with big, meaningful customers. Uh, and, and what I learned is that, like I missed the hell out of 
game design and like working with like cool creative people rather than like robots and giant enterprises. Uh, and I also just learned that everything's tangible. If something, if there's a business that makes money, you're adding value somewhere. So who cares whether it's big game developers or it's a big scary enterprise? <laughs> so that was scary for. And it's still there, by the way. It's fun. It's very different to get a paycheck regularly, and the stress is very different. Uh, I guess, like, if you give, like, the words of wisdom to anybody, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, I was, mm -hmm. like, knowing what I know now, you know, this is really what you want to do if you want to, like, mm -hmm. be sane. I, I, it almost seems like it's also, like, a personality fit. I mean, also right. for, like, entrepreneurs, it's like, you know, the, the saying, like, entrepreneurs versus entrepreneurs. And then right. if you're even thinking about, like, do you care about security? Then you're already asking the wrong questions. Right. Kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, so founding team is is a bit of a, a typo. I'm, I'm was, I was the first non-engineer, so I'm still an employee. I'm not like a founder at the company. Um, and I did that because I wanted to relax a little bit. I also just didn't know what company I would do next. So it was kind of, it's kind of what I was saying earlier. I wanted something tangible. I also wanted to learn from more experienced people. Uh, I would love to do another company again. Like it's just kind of. It's gonna suck, like, yeah. <laughs> I know it's gonna be really draining, and, but I, I'd like to think that I won't make the same mistakes again and, and uh, we'll be able to scale something. So that's, so that's kind of like the pattern, I guess. It's like, yeah. you, I mean, basically it's like you want the, how many shots on goal, and then it's like, okay, well then I need to like recharge. Mm -hmm. So say so you get knocked out, and then you go recharge, get the paycheck, yeah. you build up your funds, and then you go out. But then for you, it's like, would your next thing be self-funded or? Are you really going to try to get the VC out again? Man, I don't think. It may still fund the very beginning of it. But the thing is, there's, there's so much cash. Holy shit, there's so much capital, especially in the Valley. There's like silly amounts of money, and it's all held by people who are legitimately bored and want to do cool stuff with it. So if I'm thinking, like, let's say just for the sake of argument, I'm sitting, like, I'm worth $10, I could invest five of it in this and then have the other five for my own savings, um, that's like 50% of my net worth. Whereas someone who's made a pile, right. they're more than happy to just carve off a bunch and they won't sweat at all about it and I can keep my little life savings intact. Um, that, that's probably what I'll do, but although I may spend a little bit on the setup in the beginning. Because the, the toughest thing to do, this is one thing I learned with AppFuel, is that um, when you're out like pitching with, before you have any investors at all, it's a really scary, like no investor is going to write a check to something that doesn't even exist yet. It's really tough, and so there is actually value in setting it up yourself and then bringing in someone. So maybe I'll spend a little bit on setup and then bring someone. I don't. I can't self fund though. There's no, no way. Especially paying payroll in Silicon Valley. <laughs> I'm kidding. That's true. Yeah. Like we were an asset. We were like a very small acquisition. We didn't. No private jets. <laughs> How did you with the? Because when I was reading the description, it was saying that you were going to do it. It was like a like an R rating, some expertise, but we didn't hear anything. Yeah, I kept it tame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, it was false advertising. I can swear <laughs> it. There's a lot of bad shit in there, man. <laughs> it was fucked. We were so screwed. Like right away, um, let's say you and a partner are gonna make a business, and you're like, hey, we got this great idea. Now let's go get some, try and get investors right mm -hmm. away. Or do you say like, hey, let's try to do everything we can by ourselves, and then. Okay, oh, yeah. now we need some money. Like, at what stage is, do you think outside funding is something that needs to be thought of? It's re yeah, it's a really tough question. So, I mean, we face it a lot because, look, at any point in time, we could try to get more milestones and traction, and then we could raise money at better terms. So we're always kind of, there's this battle of, like, do we need to raise money now at bad terms, or should we go out there and try to make more progress, and then we can raise at really good terms, and then, you know, instead of diluting, instead of like giving away a ton of stock, we only give away a small amount of stock. It's, there's no right answer. I mean, you, you gotta, sometimes you'll get really good offers and you should just take them and sometimes, um, like there's a lot of, a lot of typical, there's a lot of um, sort of the, the sound bites will tell you that you should always be raising when you don't need to be raising. So, you know, if you're starting to run out of money, it's too late. Like you should go when you're in a really comfortable position and try to raise a little bit. Uh, we made the mistake of doing the opposite. We only raised when we were like living in crummy, in shitty hostels in Beijing. We were like, 
so screwed. We ran out of money. We were totally not, we were in a bad spot, and we had to go and raise at that point. It was really really hard because investors will smell it on you, and they'll realize that like, you know, they don't want to. They're not going to write you a check just so that you don't go bankrupt. They want to write you a check because they want to get rich with their check. So they have to see like lots of sort of room for it to grow, rather than we're going to save these guys from dying. Um, so, you know, if you if you can, you should raise when you don't need to. I think if I were to do another company again, I would probably. The other thing is, raising doesn't happen like instantly. You you need to like get to know a lot of investors first, and spend even even as long as six weeks, eight weeks, like just getting them comfortable with you. Um, so if I were to do another company, I would um, even long before I launched it, I would just start schmoozing everyone I could find and going to. Like conferences, this is more of like an industry conference, but there are startup conferences where there's a ton of VCs and you just like go work the floor and get to meet as many as you can. You do that well in advance because then they already know who you are and when it's time you can call like 20 of them and say, uh, we're doing our angel round. Are you in or are you out? And it's kind of like, people joke that it's kind of like dating in high school. Like if everybody wants in on one company, then all the other VCs will hear about it and they'll try to get in too. And so if you can get, if you can build up a good network of folks that you can pitch all at once, uh, it helps a lot because then it's kind of like, hey, look, the train's leaving the station. If you're not at, if you're not in this round, then it's never going to be available again. Uh, that helps a lot. But if you're just going to one at a time and you're like desperate and you need money to grow, like that's the wor that's, it's the easiest way to like look bad in front of all of them because each one of them will smell the desperation and none of them will take them if they're weak. So network as many investors as you can ahead of time, because then they'll know you for a couple years, right? Then you're not some stranger who's desperate for money. <laughs> That's the one piece of advice I'd have. Yeah. You can also softly pitch them. Like, you, it's not a hard close. You can just say, hey, I'm looking at doing a company like this. What do you think? Do you hear about stuff like this? And they'll like, give you a bit of direction as well. I have, uh, I have one friend who, I think he said he's had like 350 coffee meetings or some insane number like that. But once he had done that, he knew like literally every company that invested. It, in the all, and by the way, a big percentage of that was probably individuals too. So they weren't even VCs themselves. They were just like old, retired, like retired wealthy people that want to invest. Um, and he put in that work. He spent a couple years doing that. And then when he had to go and raise money, it was easy for him to sort of all at once get a bunch of people interested. And if even one says yes, then you go to all the other ones and say, ha. We're going to raise, and if you're not in, we're gone forever. And then they like, all get in. Um, I wouldn't say there's probably, OK, if you want to talk numbers, there's probably 10 or 12 tier one VCs, like the really big, famous companies. Um, but there's a ton of just other ones. There's like 30, 40 companies, and they all have little partners. There's like you know dozens of accelerators as well. We, like, we did the accelerator route just because we were so green. Uh, but I'm really glad we did because we didn't know anything going into it. Like it helped us. It, like <laughs> you, you learn like these accelerators. They have these like weary. The people that run them are like weary because they've seen every single screw up ever uh, for years. Like that's their whole job is to see the least experienced entrepreneurs ever, and they'll help you avoid making a lot of those mistakes, and they'll give you some cash too. Uh, so that that would be another. Like if it's a if it's the first time you're you're getting into it, I would like look at some of those. They're also easier to get into because they're used to junior founders, right? As long as they like your idea. <laughs>